Russia is not easy to understand. It was never easy to understand. It has been one of the most complex topics of history. This work aims to shed a light on Russian history, at least on its origins, to make it more understandable and accessible. Why should we understand Russia? It's simple. Russia is important. It is not possible to talk about European history without knowing some things about Russia. With its huge forests, relentless rivers, and desolate steppes, the Russian lands have been the scene of the most important and sometimes the most tragic events in human history. It is not possible to consider the development of the states established in Russia as a single process. These huge lands have been under the control of very different administrations, both culturally and socio-economically. However, like every historical process, it is possible to discover the origins of these developments. Perhaps one of the most interesting parts of Russian history is its starting point. The dynasty that gained power over the peoples in Russia in the 9th century and ruled these people for about 800 years was not even a Slavic dynasty. For 800 years, Russia was ruled by a family that came from other lands and differed both culturally and ethnically from the local Slavic people. So how exactly did this happen? In order to understand this, we need to understand the situation in Russia from the beginning of the 9th century and the environment of the Slavic peoples living there. Here is a spoiler. Like almost every good medieval story, it has something to do with the Vikings. The Slavs were a people divided into different tribes, living in a wide area starting from around Novgorod in the north of Russia and extending to the southern coast of modern-day Ukraine. The tribes that made up these people traded with the states around them and sometimes fought with each other. No Slavic tribe was able to establish a definitive and long-term superiority over the others. This struggle for superiority and power was constantly causing wars that tired the people and disrupted the trade lines and caused poverty. While the lands of the Slavs suffered from constant uncertainty and warfare, the Vikings who had sailed around the world from the north of Europe and the cold coasts of Scandinavia were living their golden age. All over Europe, the kingdoms were surrendering to them one by one, and these ruthless plunderers were establishing new states with the gold and silver they took from the kings of Europe and they were setting sail to new raids. Just around this time, a Viking leader named Rurik came to the north of the lands inhabited by the Slavs, to the lands we call Russia today. The Slavs living in the north initially resisted Rurik's forces and tried to expel him. However, some Slavs saw the strength and the determination of the Vikings as an opportunity to solve their own complex problems. They invited Rurik to rule themselves as their leader and to use his power to put an end to the endless conflicts. Rurik accepted the invitation of the tribal leaders, thus laying the foundations of the first Russian state. So, how did Rurik maintain order among the Slavic tribes? What did he do that the Slavs could not do to ensure the establishment of the first organized state on Russian soil? First of all, it is necessary to understand that it was not possible to establish a state by focusing only on civil development. At least in the geography where Rurik lived, that was impossible. Rurik used the physical strength and combat prowess of his Scandinavian warriors to destroy or threaten tribes that disobeyed his orders and forcibly subdued them. However, being strong and knowing how to fight was only one of the reasons for the success of Rurik and those around him. Rurik was showing the different tribes how they could act as one body. The aim of the Vikings was to capture a wide geography from the north to the south of the Slavic lands and to gain control over new traitors through these conquered regions. Rurik knew well that carrying out constant raids would not work and would not be sustainable. Settlements had to be captured one by one. A supply line had to be established for the frontier territories and thus the troops fighting on the borders had to receive continuous support. 
In order to do this, the settlements captured as bases had to be fortified and made suitable for trade and further developments. Rurik captured some settlements through the various and tribes under his command, ordered these settlements to be supported. He took taxes from various tribes for the maintenance of the settlements and the surrounding buildings and walls. In this way, the tribes understood that they had to pay in order to benefit from the facilities and the protection of the state. All would benefit from the silver and loot that would flow into their lands as Rurik expanded the borders. Thanks to Rurik, they understood that such gains can only be achieved as a result of well-structured plans and intense effort shown for common interests. Rurik laid the foundations of a great state that the Vikings dreamed of establishing in Slavic lands. However, his own lifetime was not enough to bring this state to full maturity. His successor, Oleg, would do it. Oleg captured Kiev approximately in 878. Kiev, or Kiev by Ukrainian pronunciation, was a very important city, not only for the region but also for the Vikings' goals in Slavic lands. When the Vikings came to Slavic lands, they did not just want to stay in the north. They wanted to go south and be close to the trade routes in the Black Sea and the great cities of the Byzantine Empire. They needed a base for their southward expedition. By capturing Kiev, Oleg fulfilled the dream of his predecessors. The capture of Kiev was such an important event that some sources consider Oleg the founder of the Russian state instead of Rurik. Kiev was considered a capital city for Oleg and his descendants. To further develop his power in and around Kiev, Oleg dominated and taxed a tribe of Slavs called the Drevlians. Oleg was investing in the development of Kiev with the taxes he received from them and other tribes. Kiev was for him a base to be used for new expeditions, a fountain of wealth from which trade and money would constantly flow and a door to new victories. Having captured Kiev, Oleg set his sights on the nearby trade routes. There was only one problem. The dominance of the Turkish Hazar Khanate on trade routes prevented Oleg from getting the desired profits. Wanting to end the rule of the Hazar Khanate, Oleg persuaded some Slavic tribes to take action against them. However, these first plunder-focused campaigns were not successful. Unable to defeat his enemy with a direct attack, Oleg defeated one of the tribes that was paying tribute to the Khanate to break the power of the Khazar Turks in the region. After that, other tribes realized that Oleg's rule was the new power that was valid in the region and started to pay Oleg the money which they normally paid to the Khazar Khanate. Although Oleg could not eliminate the Khazars as he wanted, he broke their power in the region by cutting off some of their income sources. After these events and achievements, Oleg turned his attention to the southwest of Kiev. He needed to gain the upper hand in the southwest for roads and trade routes to Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. At that time, the Magyars lived in the area the southwest of Kiev. The Magyars fought with Oleg for a while, taking some Slavic tribes to their side in order to block Oleg's way. Only later did they realize that the kingdom in Bulgaria was an easier target and they focused their attention on defeating the Bulgarians. Even though the war went badly for the Bulgarians at the beginning, the Magyars suffered a heavy defeat when the Bulgarians called the Pechenek Turkish tribes for help. Realizing that it would be difficult to survive in the lands they used to live when they were surrounded by their enemies, the Magyars migrated to the west and established a kingdom in Hungary. The Magyars' westward migration was a turning point for Oleg. There were no more obstacles for him on the way to the Byzantine lands and the pearl of the world, Constantinople. Oleg, who quickly settled his own merchants on these lands, wanted to take advantage of the weakness of the Byzantine Empire. The Byzantine Empire was large and had to deal with many problems at the same time. Constantly having to allocate resources and forces to the vast borders of the empire rendered it vulnerable to unexpected attacks. Oleg saw the opportunity of his life. Perhaps 
he had no plans to seize and hold Constantinople, but he could force the Byzantine administration under pressure. This way, he could persuade them to make very profitable trade deals and pay tribute on a regular basis. He besieged Constantinople with his mounted soldiers on land and on the sea with his various placed on many small boats. The Byzantine rulers had no choice but to submit to Oleg's wishes. A peace treaty was signed between the two states. The Byzantine administration agreed to pay tribute and sign commercial agreements to the benefit of the Russians. With the agreement in Byzantium, Oleg got what he wanted. He was now one of the leaders of Eastern Europe. Money flowed into their cities from the surrounding trade routes and their rule was gaining strength. Oleg became the one who fulfilled the dream for which Rurik laid the foundation. A new power was born. The lands controlled by this power would witness some of the greatest and most painful events in human history, from the Mongolian raids to the collapse of Napoleon's army and from Hitler's invasion to the disaster of Chernobyl.